I'm a teaching fellow at Alder Hay Hospital um, doing paediatric ENT and today we're going to go through, uh, through some throat and airway emergencies which is normally what scares everyone the most. Most of you have probably been to the ear and the nose sessions, today we'll go through throat and airway emergencies. Um, so we're going to go through various things and we'll start with um, the slightly scariest stuff first, so airway compromise and tracheostomy care and then we'll talk a little bit about the common stuff, tonsillitis, quinzies, and then some things that people don't realize come to ENT, so things like food boluses, um, ingested foreign bodies, and then Ben will take us through some common cases. Um, so airway compromise from an ENT point of view, we're talking about something called strider. And the definition of strider is a harsh, high-pitched sound, um, typically on inspiration, but not always. Um, and I think when you're in medical school, you learn that, you know, inspiratory is strider and expiratory is wheeze. But then there is a little bit of overlap because it's difficult to sp split the airway into um, certain sections. So inspiratory, when you think about inspiratory strider or an inspiratory noise, that suggests that there's an obstruction at or above the level of the vocal cords. Um, but sometimes you can get something called biphasic strider, um, which is in a sound in um inhalation and exhalation and that suggests that there's an obstruction below the courts um ben has kindly embedded these videos so i'm just going to play them just so you guys can get a little bit of a feel of what stride actually sounds like because you may not have come across it and that's absolutely fine so just for the first one <laughs> In that patient, you can see that they were having tracheal tug and they obviously looked like they were working very hard to breathe. Um, and then children get strider as well. And what's a common cause of uh, strider in children is actually things like croup, so a barking cough, or something called laryngomalacia, where the voice box is soft and floppy. Um, croup is normally more of an acute thing, so they'll get unwell and then they'll have croup and they'll settle. Laryngomalacia normally starts about one month after birth, and the parents might notice it from time to time, and it may be worse when the child has a cold. So we'll just play this video. And the parents are trying to show that the child's pulling in a little bit. So in children, you are, you are, you are more likely to see intercostal and subcostal recession, tracheal tug. And in smaller babies, you might see something called head bobbing. And that all suggests increased work of breathing. Um, and in the child, you could hear an expiratory noise as well. So that's technically biophysics. So there isn't just a noise when he takes a deep breath in. You can appreciate that there's one when he takes a deep, uh, when a, uh, he takes a breath out as well. Just pause that one. Um, so airway compromise, there's a whole host of reasons why this can happen. Um, it might not always happen so suddenly. Sometimes people think, you know, airway compromise, um, the patient comes in and, you know, they've got really, really loud strider and, you know, it's an imminent thing. Sometimes you might have patients who've had a gradual history of difficulty breathing and then they come in and they're struggling a little bit more. But the things to just be aware about is um, infection can cause um strider so an infection of the voice box um so laryngitis um epiglottitis but most commonly epiglottitis a deep neck space infection so something that's traveled from tonsillitis or a quincy and then something to just be aware about is ludwig's angina so this is an infection of the floor of the mouth and it's normally from a dental source um and patients normally look like they have this big swelling underneath and the tongue will be raised so if you look inside the mouth because there's an infection in the floor of the mouth, the tongue looks like it's slightly raised. Um, cancer is something to always be um, con uh, considerate about. Laryngeal SCC um, is the most common one. Um, and you'd probably worry more about cancer in patients who have slightly more of a gradual history. Maybe they've had some difficulty breathing, difficulty swallowing, change in voice, and then they've suddenly got worse. Um, traumas, any patient who's had neck trauma, um, whether it's blunt 
um, or penetrating, we should always worry about, you know, if they're starting to say that their voice is going a bit croaky, they're having difficulty swallowing, because it suggests that even with blunt, there may be some um, swelling around the voice box, and then that would affect their airway. Um, bleeding, so if obviously if patients had a tonsillectomy and they've got um, quite a fast bleed, blood and blood clots can go into the airway, and that's a physical obstruction that will cause um, airway compromise. Um, Foreign body ingestion is normally in children, but not always. So they may sort of see a coin and think it's a sweet and take it in and accidentally inhale it. And it can be in the trachea or lower down in either bronchi. Um, anaphylaxis is another one. So that's due to edema around the voice box. And that's why patients may present with strider. Um, a vocal cord palsy. So if one or both vocal cords for some reason aren't um, working and not moving, it reduces the amount of space for air to go in and out. And they may present with strider and a subsequent airway compromise. And another one to be um, aware about is post thyroidectomy hematoma. So the, this is when you get um, a blood clot after the patients had their thyroid removed. And this causes a physical external pressure on the trachea. And that's why they will struggle um, to breathe. We'll just quickly move on. Um, so the history is very, very key. The history will give you a lot of clues. Sometimes when someone calls you and tells you what's been going on, you probably have a good guess of what might be the cause, but obviously you will examine the patient and uh, to figure out what's really going on. Um, anything acute, you would think more about things like infection or a foreign body, um, or if there's history of uh, bleeding, uh, things that come on a bit slowly, like we said, cancer. If they've got a sore throat or a fever, I would be thinking epiglottitis or a deep neck space infection. Um, they should tell you about trauma, um, but it's always good to ask because they may not, the person referring may not think it's relevant. Um, and we, again, we've already talked about symptoms that may be suggestive of malignancy. So when you see um, get called to see a patient with um, Strider, you should try and attend as a matter of urgency. There's some advice that you can give the um, a &E doctor um, who, or whoever is referring. So you need to make sure that the patient is in a place of safety. And um, if you're doing something else as an SHO and you can't get there, then you need to let your registrar and your seniors know so someone can go and assess the patient as a matter of urgency. It's not a good idea that the pa a patient with strider should be sat in the waiting room. So it's just little things like that, because it's going to take you time to go and get your equipment and go and see the patient. Um, start with your A2E assessment and you will spend a lot of time on airway. And that's absolutely fine because that's clearly the problem. Don't just rely on observations um, because, you know, just because the patient's oxygen saturations are fine. If they're breathing like any of those videos, you can't just say, oh, they'll be OK. It's not always an accurate representation of the airway and how hard the patient is working. You generally, it's you get from the end of the bed, you can figure out how much the patient's struggling and naturally how much you should be worried. And the other things to be concerned about is if someone's visibly tiring, um, you know, or they've got a very high respiratory rate, um, you should be worried. Children compensate for a bit longer. Um, so even with a child, you just probably should have a slightly um, lower threshold to escalate because, you know, if a child does has some increased work of breathing, but they don't look necessarily tired, doesn't mean that they will necessarily be okay. We've talked about um, subcostal and intercostal recession. What are they sat like? Are they leaning forward? Are they using their accessory muscles? In children, you may see tracheal tug um, and head bobbing. And can they speak in full sentences? That's another one. If someone's very breathless and they're struggling to speak in full sentences, that's a very worrying sign and you need to escalate that appropriately. Um, safe initial management is, first of all, calm yourself. Give clear instructions. If you, um, uh, like we said, get them in and make sure that Give the other person um, in a &E some job to do. Get them in a place of safety. Sit them upright. Anyone who's lying flat with an airway problem is going to struggle, so you need to sit them up. Let your senior know sooner rather than later. I would ask normally the referrer to contact anaesthetics because it's one less thing for me to do whilst I get the scope. Um, they shouldn't be there by themselves either. They can get nursing staff to help them. And if it's a patient on the ward, for example, critical care outreach teams, um, they have them in most hospitals and they have nurse practitioners and doctors um, at times can go and basically do an A2E assessment on the patient whilst you get there. 
Um, things that you could tell them is if they get the um, the crash trolley um, or if they have a difficult airway trolley, depending on where the patient is close to the patient, pop them on high flow oxygen, um, put them on adrenaline nebulizers, which we'll talk about in the next slide, or things like Heliox. Um, that kind of saves you a job because what, what you need is measures that can help stabilize the patient. You don't want to be starting everything when you get there. Um, so like we said, sit the patient upright, high flow oxygen, doesn't matter if they have COPD, this is an emergency. So um, if they've got Heliox, that's great. Sometimes it can help. So Heliox is a combination of helium and oxygen, and it can help with things like Strider. Um, but not all places have it, or they might have it in ICU or somewhere random. Um, so in the meantime, you can put the patient on oxygen. And adrenaline nebulizers. So these are a holding measure. It's not going to cure the patient. It's just going to temporize their symptoms. Adrenaline will help take off some of that inflammation if it's infective. Um, it may not help with things that aren't necessarily infective, but most things, for example, even if it's a foreign body, if it sits there for long enough, it causes some swelling. Cancer will have some swelling around it as well. Um, so the dose, this is also on the ENTSHO website. Um, so if you ever forget and you're not sure, just the, I, I did that when I was um, a new ENTSHO. I still like now I know the dose, but if you forget, that's absolutely fine. Just check it because people will ask you because they're not always familiar with um, adrenaline nebulizers. So it's driven on oxygen and one milligram of um, adrenaline is one mil of one in a thousand. And you can give anything between one to five milligrams. So you normally take one mil of the adrenaline and then put some saline in it. So I normally put a couple of mils in. It just helps it sort of drive a little bit better than the adrenaline by itself. And if you're in a situation um, where you get there and everyone's flapping around a little bit, you need to, I would make the adrenaline nev up myself because sometimes people aren't sure. So it's good to have other skills as well. And in the meantime, I would have also asked the referrer to get IV access. Um, in an adult, if, the, if it's a very ill looking child um, who's got really bad strider, I wouldn't advise them to try IV access until I got there and saw the patient. So that's a typical medical school type question because children, again, you know, they will, they're more likely to go into um, laryngeal spasm and lose their airway. But if it's an adult and they've got IV access, they can give um, eight milligrams of dexamethasone um, as a start dose. And it needs to be dexamethasone IV. Um, sometimes people say, can we not just give it orally? It won't work quick enough. Um, and then you need to find out what the problem is. All these patients with Strider will need a scope, so what we call flexible nasoendoscopy. And tomorrow in the skill session, we'll talk a little bit more about flexible nasoendoscopy. For, but for anyone who's not um, aware, this is often abbreviated as FNE, so it stands for um, flexible nasoendoscopy. It's just a thin, small camera we put through the nose um, to look at down the back of the throat at the airway um, to see what's going on. So the things that you need to think about in the management decisions is so not all patients with strider will be as sick as each other. Um, not everyone, you know, may need a tracheostomy or sort of urgent anesthetic input. Um, it depends what's wrong with them. So the things you need to think about, and obviously you'll be discussing this with your seniors, is do they need a definitive airway now? Or if it's an infection, can we give them antibiotics and steroids and will it settle? Um, where do they need to be admitted? So is this patient going to be safe on the ward? Do they need to be on HDU or even ICU? And is there a plan if they deteriorate? So these are the things that if your senior doesn't mention that you can ask them just to prompt them. Because, for example, if you're on call, you're most likely going to get a call about the patient and you need to know what to, what the next steps are. Um, we'll move on to tracheostomy care. Ben, are there any um, burning questions in the chat? Don't worry, I'm just uh, doing some answers as you talk. So. Okay, no worries. Thank you. Um, so tracheostomy is another thing that scares everyone. And I think a lot of it is, we're not really taught in most, well, in the UK at least, I don't think anyone really covers it in medical school. So it just feels like this alien thing and everyone gets really, really stressed at the thought of assessing a patient with a tracheostomy. What is it? It's basically access at the, so um, people also refer to tracheostomies as um, front of neck access, so F-O-N-A. And if a patient isn't able to breathe normally, so from the top, um, there may be a blockage, there may be cancer, they may um, have had 
um, an infection, whatever the reason, some patients need a tracheostomy to secure their airway. So if there is some sort of blockage up here in very simple terms, you can bypass that by putting a tube at the front of the neck. So that's called a tracheostomy. Um, and essentially this secures their airway. This allows them to breathe in and out. Some patients have it as a temporary measure. Some people have it permanently. Um, some children may have it due to congenital abnormalities. Um, and normally they will have a um, sign at the end of their bed, um, which we'll talk about in a little while, which will tell you why they have the tracheostomy. So this is what this is on a dummy, but this is normally what you will see. Um, and they tend to have a dressing around them, which is important because if the skin under, around it and underneath isn't looked after properly, patients can get a lot of infections and problems with the skin and the stoma, um, which is the actual hole, can break down and cause a lot of issues. So there's various different types of tracheostomy tubes, and it's good to just have an awareness. So you can have tubes that have a cuff. For example, if patients are being ventilated or if they have a lot of secretions that, need, um, that are difficult to manage. Um, and the way to know, because this part will be inside, all you will see is this, um, is they have this little um, attachment at the end, which is where a syringe will attach to put in air and take out air. Um, so this next to it is an inner tube. So adult and trache um, pediatric tracheostomy tubes are different, but for the purposes of today, we'll talk mainly about adult tracheostomy tubes. So this is the tube that's inside the patient's neck, but it also has something called an inner tube. So the inner tube you can take out and the outer tube will stay in. So you don't have to worry about putting another tube in. And this is because a lot of these tubes will routinely get um, full of secretions and mucus plugs and they need cleaning. So it's safer to have an outer tube that stays inside whilst you clean the inner tube. This is an introducer, so this is only used when you put the tracheostomy tube in and it's removed and replaced with an inner tube. Um, you can have tubes that are fenestrated, um, so they have basically holes at the end um, that will allow patients to voice um, versus non-fenestrated tubes. Um, so initially patients will have, when they first have their tracheostomy, it'll be non-fenestrated. If they're going to have it for a longer time, then normally they're switched to a fenestrated tube and you can have um, single versus dual cannula tracheostomy tubes as well. So like we said, all patients should have, as part of the Tracheostomy National Safety Project, this sign or something that looks similar, which will normally be green at the end of the bed. And this is important because it tells you what's wrong with the patient and why they have a tracheostomy tube. Um, what's really important is whether they have what we call an intubatable airway or not. So here you can see they've written, it's a difficult airway um, and they've got a trachea because they failed the extubation and they were struggling to re-intubate. This is more the surgical style. So it'll just tell you, um, what, you know, whether it was percutaneous, um, a flap, or whether it's just a slit type tracheostomy, what size they have, which is important because if the patient needed an emergency tracheostomy tube change, it's clear to everyone what size they need. And um, for emergencies, they normally circle who you need to call um, if you're struggling with the change. Um, not all hospitals have um, an airway team, by the way. So if you're not sure, it would be um, anesthetic slash ENT. On the reverse of this, I've just split it into two so it fits into, um, so it's easier to see basically. But normally on the reverse of this should be the emergency management. And the reason it's there is no one's expected to know it off by heart. And if you're in a situation where someone's concerned about the patency of the tracheostomy, um, you can basically go through this and manage the patient. So essentially, without reading it out to you, if you think the tracheostomy tube is blocked, if there is some sort of cap or speaking valve on the outside, take it out, take the inner tube out, because if it's full of um, secretions or a mucus plug, what you might find, you take the inner tube out, the patient can breathe again and they feel okay. If they're still not better, you need to pass a suction catheter to try and suck out whatever may be there. If that doesn't help and they've got a a cuff tracheostomy tube. If you deflate the cuff, that can help. Um, essentially, if that doesn't help and you're you're worried, you know, you've suctioned, you've taken the inner, inner tube out, you've deflated the cuff, or they have um, a non-cuff tube, you need to take the tracheostomy tube out because there may be something at the bottom that is blocking it. 
Um, in ENT, because we have the scope, sometimes you might pass the, the scope down first to see what's going on rather, uh, rather than take the tube out. But if you don't know how to scope and you're not sure, it's safer to take the tracheostomy tube out because if there's a blocked tube, they're definitely not going to be able to breathe. If you get that blocked tube out, they've still got that hole to breathe through. And if it's an established tracheostomy, it's not going to collapse and sort of close up on itself. Um, and even if then it was difficult to put the tracheostomy tube in, you can give oxygen over the stoma and over the mouth as well. Uh, and by this point, you should have expert help that have come, in, um, come to help, help you, basically. Um, and then the other things it talks about is then at that point, if the patient is breathing or not, if they're not breathing, then you just do CPR as you normally would. Um, if the patient is breathing, then you will just continue your A to B um, assessment. And sometimes, for example, if they can't, if you can't get a tracheostomy tube in for whatever reason, then um, in what you might see is people try and put um, a, an ET tube, so an endotracheal tube, a smaller one down the tracheostomy stoma to try and secure the airway. Um, all patients should have by their bedside a case that looks like this. Um, and this should have everything you need to do, a tracheostomy, um, emergency tube change, and everything the patient needs um, for their care. Normally, the nurses are quite good at restocking these. Okay, so we'll move on to um, tonsillar pathology. So the most common thing that everyone uh, is normally quite happy with is tonsillitis. It's very common. A lot of people get it. Um, it's quite obvious from the history that they have quite a bad sore throat, a fever, generally not feeling well. Can take a few um days before the patient starts to feel worse they may say i started with a small uh, slight a sore throat and now it's getting worse but you need to be aware in ent that it's not just tonsillitis it can become something else especially if the patient isn't getting better you can get what we call a uh, peritonsillar um, cellulitis or an abscess which people commonly refer to as a quinsy and the infection can actually track down into the deep neck spaces which we'll talk about shortly because this is normally what tonsillitis will look like. Um, when you examine the patient, always remember your A to E assessment. Always think about speech. Um, the things to be aware of is if you think someone's got um, tonsillitis just over the phone, but you look in the back of the throat and it looks normal, that doesn't mean the patient's okay. So if someone's got um, a change in their voice, difficulty swallowing and a sore throat, but you look in the back of the throat, that shouldn't reassure you. It means the problem is lower down. It means that they need a scope. And that's just something to be aware of. So you're not discharging patients from A&E thinking that they're okay. Um, you need to look at their neck movements. If someone's got a really stick neck, uh, a stiff neck, they're drooling, they're having difficulty eating and drinking, that is not normal. Obviously, examine the oropharynx, so the throat, a torch or a headlight and a tongue depressor is essential. And have a feel of the neck. Can you feel any swellings, um, any lymph nodes? Um, and check their range of movement. Um, with regards to managing tonsillitis, not everyone needs admission. So if the patient can eat and drink, they're not sepsis, they're not, de they're not septic, they're not dehydrated, they can have um, oral antibiotics, diflam painkillers and go home. But often what you find is the ones that filter in are really, really struggling to eat and drink. And if you just send them home, they're going to get dehydrated and they're going to get worse. Um, so common things are common, get IV access and take some bloods. Um, glandular fever can present like this as well, so it's good to send um, a monospot or what we call an infectious mononucleosis screen. If they're not drinking, they need IV fluids. Um, they can't swallow, so they definitely need antibiotics through a drip. So it's normally IV benzyl penicillin, but check your uh, local guidelines. Um, and most places add in metronidazole if it's severe tonsillitis. If they're allergic to penicillin, it's normally clarithromycin or clindamycin, but just make sure you check your local guidelines. A stat dose of a steroid, so normally 6.6 .6 milligrams, helps take down the swelling and patients often feel better. And then obviously you need to treat their pain and you need to tell patients, even when they go home, they need to take regular painkillers so they can eat and drink and keep their antibiotics down. Diflam is quite useful, whether it's a spray or um, as gargles. Sometimes you have patients like this in A&E and you give them some antibiotics, some steroids, some painkillers and fluids, and they really turn around and they can go home and they don't necessarily really need admission overnight. If you've got someone who can't eat and drink, has sepsis, is scoring for sepsis and their early warning score is unstable, or you're worried that something else is go on, going on, you need to admit them and let your senior know. You should be worried about anyone who has neck stiffness, um, is drooling. Trismus is restriction um, in opening if in their mouth. So if you tell them to say ah and they do this, 
and that's all they can do, um, then that's worrying that something else is going on. Anyone, it goes without saying, with noisy breathing and strider, you should be worried about. You should think something else is going on if there's an associated neck swelling. Um, a small lymph node wouldn't necessarily be worrying, but if you can feel a decent sized neck swelling on the sides, then you would be worried about what we call a parapharyngeal abscess. Um, and anyone who's, as with anything in medicine, if they're not getting better despite the right treatment, you should just think, are we treating the right thing? So um, most people will be familiar with Quincy's, which is what we call a peritonsillar abscess. So this is a collection of pus in the peritonsillar space. So this is a space around the tonsil and it happens from tonsillitis. Patients normally present with a sore throat that's normally worse on one side. Uh, their mouth opening may be restricted, um, but it may not be awful. Um, I have seen patients with Quincy's where I've managed to drain quite a bit, but their mouth opening was actually okay. And they get this typical hot potato voice, so they sound very full when they talk. And sometimes if they've got really bad tonsillitis, they can sound, they can have a hot potato voice as well. And obviously they're gonna have pain on eating and drinking. But not all patients, interestingly, with a Quincy will be completely struggling to eat and drink. They may still be managing a small amount. Um, so the management is the same as tonsillitis. Um, and depending on where you work, some people um, try and drain it straight away. Um, in children, they probably won't let you. So you would try antibiotics for at least 24 hours. Um, but we'll talk about how you drain it, because um, essentially it's an abscess. It's a walled off collection. Most of the time it will need draining. Um, but we'll talk about that in a bit more detail tomorrow. Um, and we've talked about you need to be we've talked about this very briefly and we'll talk about it now. So you just need to be aware that a Quincy can become something a bit worse. So what you'll find is um, there will be deviation of the peritonsil. Uh, the tonsil will be basically pushed to the other side. So you'll get a swelling in the peritonsillar area. And what can happen if it's big enough is the uvula can get pushed to one side as well. What you often find in patients with a decent sized Quincy is you'll struggle to examine them. So they'll have trismus. So you might not be able to see at the back of the throat. Um, in those patients, give them some steroids, give them some antibiotics and come back, give them a little bit of time and then re-examine them. That's really, really important that you don't just forget about the patient or become frustrated and, see, and think, oh, I can't examine, so I don't know what's wrong with them. And then um, something to help guide you um, over the phone if you're getting a referral um, most times if someone refers a query Quincy, you'll probably end up seeing it, but it's just to help you triage. Um, so this was developed in COVID because obviously looking in the throat was very high risk for acquiring COVID. Um, but essentially you score points for certain things. So if someone's got a unilateral sore throat, meaning on one side it's worse than the other, you get three points because that's quite convincing that they're going to have um, a Quincy. Trismus scores you two, male gender gives you one and a hot potato voice gives you one. If they've got zero to three, it's very unlikely that they're going to have um, a peritonsillar abscess. But if they've got more than four, then you're probably, you know, even without seeing them, you're going to have a very high index of suspicion that they will have a Quincy. Deep neck space infections are something that people don't really have um, much of an awareness about. It's not often taught that well in medical school, but if you're going to do ENT, it's good to know it exists so you can look out for it. Um, so there's two spaces within the neck. So there's one called the parapharyngeal space and one called the retropharyngeal space. And they're actually quite thin spaces and um, difficult to understand initially and get your head around. Um, and normally these will be diagnosed on um, a scan. Uh, a parapharyngeal space, it runs from the skull base to the hyoid bone. So it's actually quite a significant area where an infection can run. Um, and with the retropharyngeal space, this extends from the base of the skull to the mediastinum. So someone with a retropharyngeal um, abscess can become very sick because they'll have pus in their mediastinum, which is not good news. If it's very, very small, that sometimes it can be treated with IV antibiotics, but most likely these infections will need surgical drainage. Um, and to diagnose this, the patients most likely, you could have a suspicion for it, but you will need a CT scan with contrast to know whether the patient has this or not. Um, so things that might make you think about a deep neck space infection, it's not going to happen overnight. So it's normally the patients who have had, you know, two weeks of tonsillitis, maybe had antibiotics for a little bit in the meantime, got a little bit better and then have got worse. Um, their neck will would normally be stiff. So you would ask them to look side to side and chin to the chest. If they're struggling to do that, you should worry that something else is going on. 
Um, worst case scenario, you know, they'll have trismus, um, drooling. If you've got a patient sat in front of you spitting in a bowl who can't move their neck, that is not good news. You may be able to feel a neck swelling, um, but if it's the start of um, uh, an abscess and it's not that big, you may not always be able to feel a neck swelling. And if it's become quite advanced, um, they're going to have strider because it's going to start to compress on the airway. Your ENT registrar will want to know about this sooner rather than later. But in the meantime, you can get IV access, give them some steroids, give them some antibiotics, fluids and analgesia, um, send off some blood tests. They're going to need a scope to see if there is any bulging um, and compression on the airway. And like we said, they're going to need a CT from the skull base um, to the neck or to the thorax, depending on where you think it is, because that's where the space stems from, um, with contrast to pick up the abscess. And if you think someone has this, keep them nil by mouths, give them IV fluid so they can um, stay hydrated. And the likelihood is they won't probably be able to eat and drink because they may need surgery. So if they have a little bit, and if it's an emergency and they need to go to this, then it doesn't really matter if they're starved, but it's good to think ahead. So we'll move on to um, post tonsillectomy hemorrhage. This is another one um, that scares people and it can be either a bit of nothing or it can be, you know, something that needs to go to theatre straight away. You should always try and see anyone who's, ble who's bled after a tonsillectomy, whether that's a vomit or coughing up blood, um, sooner rather than later. It's more common than you think. Um, it is more dangerous in children in the sense that if they lose um, a certain amount, sort of 500 mils of blood, it's gonna affect them more than say a grown adult. Um, usually, like I said, it can be innocuous, but it literally can be life-threatening. Um, there will be patients that you just sort of cast your eye on them in um, A&E resource and then you're wheeling them to theater. Be careful, anyone who's had a bleed, um, even if it's stopped, it's better to admit them overnight for observation because you can get, get something textbook within the textbooks, which is described as a heralding bleed, where they have a small bleed, it stops, and then they start with another bleed. Primary, so suggests that, um, you know, um, there may not have been a problem with the surgery, but maybe the hemostasis wasn't perfect. Um, can happen within less than 24 hours. Um, but there are some techniques that can make you more prone to a primary bleed than others. And then secondary is if it's more than 24 hours. And this normally peaks at day five post-op. And this is normally secondary to an infection. So the classic patient with a secondary bleed is normally someone who has had a lot of pain, hasn't been eating or drinking, uh, has got an infection, and then they've started bleeding. Most secondary bleeds can be managed conservatively. And... Um, Nine times out of 10, a primary bleed will go back to theatre, but sometimes secondary bleeds do end up going to theatre. So you shouldn't just think, oh, it's day five post-op, they'll be fine. Um, so it depends what the patient's like. So if it, if they're actively bleeding, get help. Again, advice you need to give over the phone, make sure the patient's an area of safety, get any to help you out. They should have IV access, full blood count, group and save or cross match, um, IV fluids, and then give blood if appropriate. The patient needs to be sat upright, and if they're coughing up clots or any blood, their mouth should be suctioned. Um, anesthetic should be on their way as well. Sometimes you can get some gauze and put some topical adrenaline and put it on the back of the throat, but sometimes patients gag and don't tolerate this very well. Um, but if they're like this, they need to go back to theatre. Or if there's a very large clot in either tonsil or fossa, but there's no active bleeding, they need to go back to theatre. Um, if you're not that confident, don't try and suction a big clot um, off the tonsil of fossa to see if it bleeds by yourself. Um, sometimes you might see a registrar do that, um, but if you're new to ENT, um, sometimes I know a &E will suggest it. I wouldn't unless you know how to manage it. Um, if they say, oh, I had some bleeding, I spat out some blood or I vomited some blood, but now I'm absolutely fine. Normally they need, depending on where you work, um, admission between 12 to 24 hours. Um, they normally started on IV antibiotics because we assume that um, it's related to infection. And you can give something called hydrogen peroxide gargles, which tends to help stop the bleeding. But this needs to be diluted. And it's normally written on the back of it how it needs to be diluted. Um, ingested foreign bodies. So um, the history is normally quite clear patients will say you know I was eating this and I feel like something stuck in my throat but with children sometimes it's not that obvious and these things don't always show up on an x-ray depending on what they are your history is really important you need to know what were they eating could they finish their meal can you swallow now and if they have any pain and where about it is 
they need to do um, an examination as you would do any ENT examination. So have a look at the back of the throat. Is there something stuck on the tonsil? Sometimes things like fish bones can stick on the tonsil and um, you know, that's easily removed and the problem solved. Have a feel of their neck. Um, anyone who's got surgical emphysema of the neck, you need to be worried about. So if you can feel like bubble wrap um, crepitations on the neck or even on the chest, that is not a good sign. Um, if you can't see anything, um, a scope is really helpful to have a look at their voice box to just see if you can see anything. Um, and then always think about airway compromise. Um, investigations. So I would normally say it's useful to do a lateral soft tissue neck x-ray um, to look for the foreign body, um, but you might not always see it. So even some fish bones don't come up on um, x-ray. So just because you can't see anything doesn't mean that the patient's fine. Um, other things to look for is if there's significant straightening of the C-spine on the x-ray, that suggests something's not quite right. Or if there's thickening of the retropharyngeal tissues, it suggests that something isn't quite right. Um, if you think that they may have aspirated or there might be a foreign body lower down, it's useful to get a chest x-ray. If the patient's very symptomatic and you can't really see a foreign body, um, then it's useful to get a CT neck as well. Um, sometimes you get patients with um, who present a little bit late and the history is not very clear. Sometimes a CT is very helpful for them. Um, but obviously if they've got an acute airway problem, you wouldn't wait around for a CT. Then they would need to go to theater to have a look. So some things you might see on a, um, an X-ray, sometimes it's really obvious, you know, you have a look and you can see the foreign body and there's your answer. Um, this is These are both in the esophagus because this is your trachea. So what do you do? So if it's a soft food bolus, so soft food bolus, you're not going to see um, on an X-ray. Um, there's medical therapy. So you can give the patient. So a &E normally will have tried giving them a fizzy drink um, or some buscan IV to see if that helps. Um, if it doesn't, then they basically need the food bolus to be removed. Um, depending on where you work, so some places gastro take all the food boluses um, and do a flexible um, OGD um, because they can do it with sedation, whereas the rigid one needs a general anesthetic and it's just easier. But in some places it comes to ENT, but it normally depends where it is. So if it's at the level of the cricopharynges, um, to so the upper part of the esophagus, then normally it comes to ENT. Um, in children, normally it's done, um, they'll need a GA anyway, so they probably wouldn't tolerate under sedation, but it's normally a joint case with the paediatric surgeons. Because sometimes what, hap what happens most of the time with soft food boluses is when they get relaxed and have the general anaesthetic, it passes down. So it gets past the point um, that the rigid scope can, can get to. So we normally need our gastroenterology or paediatric surgery colleagues to give us a hand. Anything that's sh sharp or if, even if you can't see um, it on an x-ray, because not it's, it, if it's like a really thin sort of needle or something like that, you might not always see it on um, the x-ray. Um, but if it's something that's quite obvious, like a button battery, the patient will need an urgent esophagoscopy to get it out. Um, and anything that's in the airway, again, and it's normally children, but not always. Uh, assess them as a matter of urgency and they will need um, an airway assessment and a bronchoscopy for removal. Sometimes if it's gone down inside the bronchi respiratory can give us a hand with getting um, them out. So always worry about button batteries or where, anywhere where anyone says the word button battery you need to be worried. Um, or patients who have signs of esophageal perforation and mediastinitis. So patients with an ingested foreign body or even a soft food bolus you need to ask about chest and back pain um, if they've had a temperature check their obs for tachycardia and we talked about surgical emphysema if they have any of these you should be worried and let your senior know um, so we'll talk a little bit about sore throat triage so what can the patient swallow so they may have um, painful swallow um, but they can eat um, some sort of soft food or even normal food and drink water normally. Um, they may say that they're having sort of mushed food, soft foods, or they may say they can only manage fluids. Um, and then they may say they can't have anything. And that's when you should be worried. Anyone who can't swallow the saliva, you should be worried about. Anyone who's drooling or spitting in a bowl, you should be worried about. Anyone with any associated voice change, you should be worried about. Um, so if they've got a hoarse, weak, croaky voice, um, you should think 
and you know if they've got a sore throat um, a croaky voice they can't eat and drink you need to be worried about those patients um and they may have what we talked about this hot potato voice um if they've got voice change it's most likely going to be um a deep neck space infection or something like epiglottitis even though it's rare but it can happen still um uh, in children or in adults uh, children will more likely be more unwell with it and if they've got this hot potato voice um, then you think tonsillitis or peritonsillar abscess so it's this is why it's really important to examine the patient in medical school you're taught traditionally hot potato voice equals quinsy that isn't always the case sometimes if you've got really bad tonsillitis or glandular fever you can sound a little bit full um, how wide can a patient open their mouth um, so always think in ENT, you'll learn very quickly. You always should ask about any dental pain. Um, so anyone with trismus, it may be a quinsy, but it might not be a quinsy. It may be um, a dental abscess. It may be um, uh, it may be a peritonsillar abscess, but you can also get something called peritonsillar cellulitis, which is basically the star of a quinsy. So it becomes really red and inflamed, but it's not yet quite collected pus within it. But if you didn't treat it, probably will start to. Um, and trismus should make you think there is pus somewhere causing muscle spasm. Um, this is a nice little flow chart that's taken um, from ENTSHO. Um, about sore throat triage and it's quite useful to use when you're quite new if you're, if you're not feeling quite confident um, so when they're swallowing you need to clarify what they can't swallow so if you get a phone call um, or even when you're assessing the patient like I can't swallow try and get out of them what they can and they can't swallow um, because if they actually can swallow um, some soft food and drink some water then they probably you know if they've got tonsillitis they can probably go home as long as they're not septic but if they're not managing anything, then they need admission. Um, always think about, you know, hoarse voice, fevers. Um, and if the patient does have any voice change, you need to think there's something going on um, deeper than what you can see. Um, if they've got sort of trismus or um, ear pain, you may think about quinsy or peritonsillar cellulitis. Um, but if they don't have any of these, it may well be that they've just got a viral sore throat or tonsillitis, which is fine. You can still admit for that. Um, but it's just to have an awareness about it. Um, so cases, shall I hand over to you, Ben? Yeah, perfect. Um, so now we've uh, got eight cases just to quickly have a go at putting what you've just learned uh, to the test. So if we could have the first one up, please, Amara. So, so. A 22-year-old lady presents to a GP with a two-day history of sore throat, no associated cough or fevers. She's managing to eat and drink and her neck is soft and non-tender. So have a little think about what your top diagnosis would be, what treatment you'd advise and whether she needs to be seen by ENT. And this is obviously a picture of her throat. Okay, that's half of you. Final 10 seconds to get your answer in. Okay, I'm going to share the results. So you can see almost everyone went for tonsillitis, um, which is reasonable. You can see kind of big swollen uh, exudative tonsils. Uh, in terms of treatment, we had a pretty much 50-50 split uh, between sort of just some simple analgesia, so paracetamol, ibuprofen, diflam gargles, or immediate antibiotics. Um, now, it's a little bit of a, and I've got in brackets, clav. I guess a little bit of a warning about whether you can tell whether it's glandular fever or bacterial tonsillitis, so it's often a good idea to avoid uh, amoxicillin or anything with amoxicillin in until you've got done some kind of testing so a monospot uh, the bloods uh, to avoid uh, reactions um, and uh, we'll come on to a bit more just in the next slide and does she need to be seen by ENT so about it's again about 50 50 so I would suggest not so what we've kind of talked about reasons to 
triage in being big ones being can they eat and drink and are they systemically well so it's a relatively low likelihood that there's anything serious going on here and just managing to eat and drink and cope at home so this is just uh em emphasizing this there's different scores scoring systems that can help you decide this particularly in primary care so two popular ones being the fever pain score or center score and um, both designed to try and give you a probability of there being a streptococcal infection so if you plug in kind of her numbers into a center score then you end up with this 11 to 15 percent probability of a strep infection um so it's kind of just promoting nice and in the uk recommends in these lower risk patients who are systemically well either not prescribing antibiotics or trying a delayed prescribing strategy just uh for antibiotic stewardship and if we try the next case so this time we have a five-year-old boy he's taken to A&E by his parents spitting blood he's past medical history he's had a tonsillectomy six days ago and otherwise well Final five seconds. Okay, I'm gonna share the results. So we had some fairly fairly confident voting, which is nice. So almost everyone's right. Yeah, secondary post tonsillectomy bleed. So in answer to the first question, no, you shouldn't have blood in the oropharynx is not not a good outcome post operative. Um, primary post tonsillectomy bleeds less than twenty four hours secondary longer than 24 hours so correct here um, and you can see this blood clot with the green arrow pointing to it and then should you admit or not we we kind of advise a cautious approach is is good with post tonsillectomy bleeds so we've heard about how you can have herald bleeds so small bleeds followed by a larger bleed which can even be life-threatening i guess particularly if the child's actively bleeding like in this case you want to be moving there somewhere where they're going to get monitored um not just sending them home, really. And we'll do the next one. So this time we have a 19-year-old student arriving at A&E with a four-day history of worsening sore throat. She's now struggling to eat and drink, but is able to open her mouth fully. Her obs, heart rate's 121, blood pressure's 105 over 78, and her temperature's 38.3. All right, so that's about half of you. I'll give a final 10 seconds for anyone who's sitting on the fence. So a bit of a, a little bit of a spread for the first one of top diagnosis. So we've got bacterial tonsillitis and glandular fever taking up uh, about 40% of the vote each. And I think they're both reasonable top diagnosis. I guess the, the point of the question is really, they've obviously got inflammation of the tonsils. It's hard to know from just looking at it what the etiology is, was really the point of the question. So very often it's viral, could be bacterial. Um, in terms of investigation, so it follows on nicely from that. So most people wanted to do some bloods, including using E's, FTs, and monospot. Uh, and this can get, kind of quite help you with that first question quite nicely. So monospots are test for glandular fever. It's not perfect, but it's a, a good starting point. Other things you might expect is deranged LFTs um, and potentially so high white cell counts and uh, sometimes low platelet counts in glandular fever. Uh, microbiology throat swabs aren't used very often for tonsillitis and then CT neck would be if you're worrying about deep neck space up abscesses, but she's able to open them up fully. So there's no trismus, so potentially not the first best first line test. Um, and then what treatment would you not want to give? So this was, I maybe gave the game away a little bit before, but a bit of a trick question. So not wanting to give IV amoxicillin until you've decided whether you've got glandular fever or not. Um, and then the other things all being reasonable parts of your first line plan. So we, as we heard before, kind of aggressive initial management can often help people with tonsillitis needing hospital admissions. So 
that would include sort of a start dose of steroids, good painkillers and rehydrating if they've not managed to have anything to drink for a couple of days. And this is just showing a post amoxicillin rash if you've in someone with glandular fever. So don't be that person. Um, all right. And the next. I'm just quickly look. So sorry, they're, they're just in the chat. The correct answer in this case was glandular fever. So I think having a differential of top diagnosis, I guess it's treat it as tonsillitis, but having the back of your mind, you need to exclude glandular fever. You then get the answer from doing those blood tests. Um, so sorry for case four. So this time we have a 26 year old man presenting to his a &E with a five day history of sore throat, which is now worse on the right. And he's unable to open his mouth fully. And you're having a little look in his throat. All right, I'm just going to do another five seconds or so because uh, responses have been really quick. So this one, everyone's feeling confident about Quincy's, which is nice because uh, I think it's a big cause of uh, uncertainty in people who've not, not done ENT before. Um, so you can see this anterior tonsil arch has been displaced medially. Um, which is sort of the, the classic sign. And yeah, you want to drain it. Um, so really good. And if you want to hear about how to drain it, that's tomorrow's session. So hopefully see you there. And then if we do our next case. So this time we've got a 33 year old lady who's coming to A&E at 3 a.m. with a sore throat after eating chicken wings after a night out. And again, we're getting pretty quick voting. So final 10 seconds to get you, you vote in. So pretty, pretty confident answering. So what we're, we're looking here is a normal throat. So she doesn't have any obvious cause of a sore throat in her mouth. Um, from the histories, most of you've picked up, there's a pretty good chance of there being a foreign body. Uh, she's got pain, pain in the throat, thinks there's something stuck there. Um, Borhe syndrome, so of that, if she'd been vomiting lots, risk of esophageal rupture. But um, but in this kind of scenario, foreign body is much more likely. And what investigation would you request next? So lateral uh, neck x-ray, as we saw before. A flexible OGD, not so FNE, so the nasal endoscopy is a reasonable kind of thing that you can do on the ward requesting gastro to do an OGD wouldn't be the kind of first step getting a lateral neck x-ray would be better all right so you've we got her scan so what are you looking at And I'm gonna share it there. So we've had a bit of indecision about the where the foreign body is. Um, so the yellow arrow is actually pointing at the hyoid bone, which uh, is often a source of confusion. So this it's maybe not the best quality image, but the blue arrow is pointing at a, uh, you can see with the eye of faith, there's a bit of a radio uh, dense kind of spike there sitting there. That's it. That's it. Yeah. And the other big giveaway of the foreign body is actually you can see what we were talking about before. There's quite a lot of uh, prevertebral swelling. So you can see this prevertebral soft tissue is swollen out. So all kind of irritated by that foreign body there. So they're sort of two good signs to look out for. Um, and then in terms of management, again, we've got a little bit of a split. So IV buscopan for soft food boluses. So you're trying to relax the sphincter and let it down. It's not uh, useful if you've got worrying about a sharp foreign body. Flexible OGD again at this sort of height above uh, the yeah above the kind of stick and it's pretty much I think unanimously certainly in our centre managed by ENT 
who'd be doing a rigid uh, esophagoscopy to fish it out. So we've got a 62-year-old man who presents to A&E for the second time this week with a severely sore throat. He's pyrexial, drooling, and his horse is, his voice is hoarse. He's got past medical history of type 2 diabetes and hypertension. Final 10 seconds to get your answer in. Okay. Um, so we've got a bit of a spread and we're going to see uh, a picture in the next slide. But I think the things that are worrying in this history to make you think it's more than just tonsillitis. So he's drooling, so he's not managing to swallow even his own saliva. Um, and he's also got voice changes, which is concerning. And he's systemically unwell with a fever. So they're three kind of alarm bells, which are making you worry that it's something more serious, such as epiglottitis, um, which is what most of you voted for, which is a very reasonable concern. Um, Superglottic tumour, you wouldn't be expecting that kind of infected picture. And peritonsillar abscess, tonsillitis, they can cause you to drool, um, but you wouldn't be expecting kind of a hoarse voice change in the same way. So you, should he be admitted to hospital? Yes, as most of you said, you, you don't want to be reassuring someone who might have something more serious going on. Um, and we're going to see his throat next. Yeah, so this you can see an intubated throat. So he's been intubated in this big edematous uh, epiglottis. And I guess the thing to say is just about this disaster triad. So things that should sort of raise your alarm bells is kind of rapid onset, severe um, dysphagia, so drooling, having a hoarse or no voice and being systemically unwell are kind of red flags for impending airway compromise. And if that's the case, then you don't want to be just, you don't want to be examining the throat alone as a junior. You want to be getting senior support from your tea, uh, maybe even an anesthetic colleague um, and I think the other thing to highlight is it depends where you're working in the world. Um, if you've got, uh, so Haemophilus influenza Bs were one of the big causes of epiglottitis. And in the UK, so it used to be a predominantly childhood thing, but in the UK now there's good vaccination rates. It actually is starting to present more commonly in older patients, often with comorbidities such as um, diabetes, like we saw before. But if you're working uh, internationally, as I know a lot of you are, then actually it might still be more common in kids if they've and whether they've been vaccinated or not is sort of a key history detail. And we'll see it. So this is the second last case. So we're getting there. Um, so this time we've got a 68 year old man who presents to A&E with stride or an increased work of breathing. Lots of causes of airway compromise, but that initial management for all of them is the same. And I'm going to share it there. So, sorry, this is the, the negative question. So what would you not advise is to lie the patient flat. So sitting patients up is often best for their airway. And it'll certainly sort of being in secretions caught there. Things you do want to try, so high flow oxygen, IV steroids, so that 8 milligram dexamethasone, typically an adrenaline nebulizers. Um, and you can do, so it's one mig, one a thousand, you can do up to five cycles uh, reassessing between. Uh, and then just the basics. So you want to get help, you want to get senior support from the anesthetic colleagues, senior ENT uh, colleagues, and you want to review them somewhere safe. So if you're an A&E, resuscitation is perfect. If you're near a theatres, again, so you kind of want that environment where you can have airway support if needed, essentially. Um, don't just do it on the corridor on your own. And this is his airway. So it's just a single single question. So you've got 25% chance of getting it right. What do you think that is? So yeah, this is a supraglottic tumour, as you're saying. So supra is essentially saying above the vocal cords. So it's above the glottis, the glottis being the opening subglottic would be below it um doesn't yeah 
it looks a bit more like a growth than a foreign body. Um, so yeah, superglottic tumor, superglottitis being infection, but this looks more like a growth than red erythema, a sort of infective appearance. All right, and we'll do the next final case. So this is a three-year-old girl who's been brought to A&E by her parents, who saw her eat something shiny on the floor. They're not sure what it was. And this is her x-rays. So she's got an anterior and a lateral film. So yeah, this is this is an x-ray of a child with a button battery. Um, yeah, and the, the other stuff's just red herring. So it's obviously hard to tell until you remove it, but anything with that kind of classic uh, circular shape, um, you want to worry, particularly if children have been playing with anything with a button battery in it. So, you know, TV remotes, uh, grandparents' hearing aids, you know, there's button batteries and all sorts of things, watches. Um, where is the foreign body? So the big question is it in the, the food pipe or the windpipe? And we've got a spread of confidence. Um, so the big, the helpful one here is really this lateral film. So you can see that there's this, uh, if Amara maybe points it out, kind of air filled uh, tube in front. So you can see that a patent kind of airway. So this is in the esophagus line um, posteriorly to that. So lateral film was really helpful to work out which one you're in. And that obviously gives away the answer to part three of whether you want to go into the airway or the esophagus. Um, so this is button battery in the esophagus and you want to do an esophagoscopy to get it out. And I guess just to reaffirm, button batteries can do an awful lot of damage. So you want to want to remove them as soon as possible. So thanks for, for joining. If you want to, would really appreciate if you could give us some feedback. So I'm just going to pop the, the link in the chat. And if you do that, you'll also get a certificate will be generated and emailed out to you for coming and if anyone wants any questions you can either pop them in the chat or or say them out loud <laughs>